So organizations like the FDA came out of a large problem with non-trained people or professionals, however you want to call them, selling products and claiming that they had medical value and they may or may not have had medical value or potency or the function that they were claiming to have. So when somebody uses the term snake oil today, what they're usually trying to say, a lot of times you hear the phrase quack medicine. And they're trying to say, oh, it's quack medicine. I hear this about Chinese medicine too. And the thing is, is that more than half the world's population uses this as primary health care. It doesn't mean that half the world's population are idiots. It's just a different science. So when you step back 150 years and you take a look at what was happening in the United States, first off, there weren't 50 states. The United States doesn't look like it did today. People didn't have the capacity to communicate over large distances of, of time and space in a very quick manner. And so there was a need for the government to step in and try to regulate some of the things that were being claimed. As the railroads were being built, the Irish were being hired on the East Coast and the Chinese on the West Coast. And with the Chinese came their medicine and all of their medical practitioners. And actually, snakes are used as medicinal substances. There are snake oils that are made from snake. The railroads really like the Chinese because compared to the Irish, they were in fantastic health. The Irish didn't have the medical practitioners of the knowledge and they weren't taking care of themselves quite as well as the Chinese were. And so the Chinese had a great work ethic and they didn't get as sick and they lasted a lot longer. I think the media may have used that word in a way to you know, demonize medicine that wasn't coming from a formally trained doctor. And the problem here is, is that there weren't very many formally trained doctors up until World War II. I don't know the exact statistics, but fewer than 50% of doctors would have been trained, formally trained, and actually have gone to a medical school. Most people around the world up until recently, in, until after World War II, would have been trained from an apprenticeship. And so you worked in a doctor's office, and that's how you learn the medicine. You have another definition of a snake oil in that as people were out west, people got bit by snakes. I lived out in California for five years, and there's a whole bunch of poisonous snakes that just wander up into your house sometimes, or onto your back porch. And so if you lived out west before there were people, I can imagine that there might have been some run-ins with snakes, and a lot of them are poisonous. And so you had lots of antidotes and things like that that were people making for snake bites. And they may or may not have been effective, and again, that needs to be regulated for those snake oils. Something that people don't talk about is there's actually an herb that comes out of Canada and northeastern United States and in its common name it's called snake root and snake root is also extracted as an essential oil and it's a species of wild ginger and they're actually again pharmacy tradition using essential oils as medicine and tinctures and other types of extracts. A lot of these extracts would have been fragrant, you know, again, going back into volatile compounds, essential oils. But the snake root oil, again, snake root being the common name, was used in a wide variety of pharmacy compounding, you know, things that people were buying. The primary purpose of the FDA in general is, is public health and safety. So the, that's the first thing they're looking for in a, any product they regulate is, is it safe for consumer use? For the FDA to approve things, they need to have scientific proof. So in order to get scientific proof, we need to do studies. In order to do large studies, we need money. It will cost a lot of money. Who is paying normally the money to do large studies? It's the pharmaceutical industry because they want to make money with their new drugs. They hope to, have to find a new blockbuster you know, for a billion dollar uh, sales a year, like the statins are. So they will invest a lot of money in drug development, but they will probably not invest anything in essential oil because there's really no patents you can fill on that. So there's really no sales for them to do with these kind of drugs. It's really simple. It really goes back to money. You know, when you look at the FDA and pharmaceutical companies, so many of those people are really tied together. And really, the fact is it really comes down to money and that's, that's the only reason. So although more and more pharmaceutical companies start going into the supplement market because it's an enormous market. I mean, when you look at about 60 to 80 percent of the population is taking one or more supplements, right? So it's a tricky question. The FDA is charged to keep the public safe. For the last 15 years, I was heavily involved in drug development. 
what we do, we ask someone to bring back a plant from the jungle, flowers, trees, any plant. And then we give this to the chemists and we say, look, can you analyze this plant for me? By the end of the day, you get a readout of the components that you find in the plants. You don't always know what these components are, but you see curves with a whole bunch of different peaks. And then suddenly you see a huge peak and then again, small peaks. And we came kind of to the conclusion, probably wrongly so, that if you see a huge peak of something in a plant, that that's an active substance. Now that's uh, sometimes a very dangerous assumption because sometimes these little small peaks are as important or more important. So you're getting a readout and then you tell the chemist, look, I see a big peak, why don't you go back in the laboratory and recreate that synthetically for me? So the next day he goes in the laboratory, starts cooking and comes back with a substance. Then you look at that and say, well, pretty cool. So now you start doing cell line studies. You put, let's say in cancer research, we, we take very well-known cancer cells and we mix them together with these substances uh, that we just synthesized. And then we see whether it inhibits cancer growth or not. If it does, then we move on to what we call in vivo studies, where we take some animals with well-known uh, cancer models, and then we look at, is it able to basically save that animal or not, or decrease the tumor growth? And then we can move into a human trial. So what we just created is a drug that is made out of a huge peak, only one substance, Whereas in the plant that we gave in the first place to analyze, we had maybe up to 2,000, maybe only 500, maybe 3,000 compounds. So we took one out of them, we now synthesize it so we can give an enormous dose of it, and it will just do one thing typically, because it's one compound. They will have side effects, why? Because you're giving an unnaturally high dose of a single thing to a patient that is not natural. Whereas if I could go back to the plant where we started in the first place, I would have something that is very well balanced and I could give that to the patient. The same substance is in there, but it's natural. And because we have 2000 compounds in it, you know, or more, we're gonna see multiple effects. We're gonna not only treat symptoms, we may even treat the cause. And that's, you know, the light I had to go on in my head is, oh my God, this is the same thing I was doing in drug development, but it's the pure form, it's the natural form, it's the complete form. Now, what I'm saying is very, very difficult to say in a sense, because the FDA has approved the essential oils as food supplements or cosmetic supplements, and the FDA has not approved essential oils as treatment modalities, certainly not to internalize. And you and I, we are consuming essential oils on a daily basis, we just don't know it. They're in all the food flavorings. This is what essential oils are being used mostly for food flavoring, right? Or for cosmetics. So we know that they saved, they have a safe history of thousands of years. The FDA is not interested in anything unless it can be classified as a drug. Drugs generally in their mind are man-made substances, they're not natural. They are really controlled by the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceuticals are not interested in anything that doesn't make them a profit. And to make a profit, they need to have something that they can uniquely own and patent, like a drug that's not natural, it's man-made, and it's unique. And so a non-patentable medicine is of no interest to the pharmaceuticals, and the Food and Drug Administration is not interested either. But if you have something that's supposed to be an effective drug, they want to see a toxicity study. That means that you have to get a, a set of lab animals and you start giving doses of your stuff to the animal population and you keep increasing it until half of the population dies. It's called the lethal dose that 50% of your animals die. It's called the LD50 number. Well, if you have something that's natural and it's not toxic and you cannot find a lethal dose, they will not accept that. In their philosophy, no medicine can be effective unless it's toxic. Hospitals have a tremendous potential to be replacing artificial chemical disinfectants with natural things like essential oils. Because who feels good breathing any of those disinfectants? I know I never do. I've never heard anybody smell chlorine and be like, mmm, that smells amazing. And they, you don't feel better smelling it. But you can use essential oils and products and things like this within a medical environment to help decrease microbe, you know, microbial loads. 
And I think this ties back into up until World War II, you had practices of fumigation. And so people in medical wards and churches, anytime there were outbreaks, people were burning herbs. You had, you know, incense, essentially, fumigation. They were burning things for the smoke. And the smoke had disinfectant properties, antimicrobial properties. And you can do that now with essential oil extracts as opposed to fumigating within a hospital. And I think there's tremendous potential in buildings, not just hospitals, but any kind of building, because not only are they antimicrobial, but you feel better, it elevates your mood. This is really common technology in Japan. The Japanese use whole system aeration, so they actually pump it through the ducts, and they'll, they'll change what they do in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening to help moderate people's, uh, to help moderate people's energy levels. And so later in the day, they'll pump it full of stuff that helps, you know, bring up their energy level and helps calm their nerves. Because by the end of the day, you're tired and frazzled. And so you need a little pick-me-up. Whereas in the morning, you come in and you're gung-ho and they'll pump stuff into the air that helps you focus. And so the difference here, as opposed to, say, going into a mall where some of this aeration technology exists, and they're using it to try and control your buying habits, by using this in an office environment or in a hospital, what you're trying to do really is elevate people's moods, make them not so tired, you help them feel less stressed. Instead of trying to control them, really what you're helping them do is relax and stay focused. There are malls, there are department stores and things like this that do use fragrances. We see this all the time. Go to the food court and you smell cinnamon walking by Cinnabon. You know, gets your digestion going. Oh my God, I want to eat that. You know, anytime you walk by a restaurant and you smell food, it does the same thing. You walk into, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch and it has their fragrance sprayed everywhere and it kind of puts you in that like, I'm really cool kind of zone. But, but the technology is used in malls and department stores. Oftentimes it's subtle. It's not something right in your face and you like really get hit by it and you're aware of it. These things are you know, done in small doses. And same thing is done in, in China and Taiwan where they have the technology that's actually built into the heating and air. And so it's pumped throughout the building. And generally they'll have one, two or three phases, a morning and, you know, lunchtime, afternoon and a mid afternoon, you know, hit that helps to, depending on what they're trying to do, moderate their attitude and productivity in the office. You go to some place like Japan where they have this very long-standing tradition of incense. And to most Japanese, incense is equated with death because it's usually used with funerals. But fragrance in Japan has a very long tradition of, you know, moderating mood and enjoyment and making people happy, you know. So this kind of stuff is not new information to a lot of people in the East. But here in the West, it's all this new research and, oh my gosh, guess what we discovered? And it's kind of like discovering the moon. You know, like, you know, a lot of people have seen it up there, but now there's research to show that it's there. I use oils to improve athletic performance, or exercise performance. So I use that with professionals, with athletes, but as well with people like me that just want to improve the exercise. When you take peppermint and you, you, you rub it on your muscles and you inhale it, ah, you're getting more air. Well, the reason for that is you, you're opening your small airways in your lungs. So therefore you're getting more oxygen and the oxygen will go into your blood and now you have more oxygen delivery to your muscles. So that will lead to a longer muscle contraction before you reach what we call a lactic threshold. The lactic threshold is when you don't have enough oxygen and you can produce energy with your muscles, the muscle will start using a pathway that does not use oxygen. We call this anaerobic pathway and it will create lactic acid. So when you build up a lot of lactic acid in your muscle, then the muscle will quit working. So how easy it is just to use a little bit of peppermint and the lactic threshold goes up. And so I use this for my workout. I use this with athletes. I use peppermint. I use other oils. I use oils that already prevent the soreness of the muscle when I'm done with the workout. I can work out better. I can work out longer. You take one drop of peppermint in a glass of water just before you work out. Your grip strength will increase by 34%. Your vertical jumping will increase 7% and your long jumping just out of your standing will increase 6%. Why is that? Because you just got more oxygen in your muscle. So I use peppermint, not just rub it on my muscle and inhale it, I also put one or two drops in my drink. And so I increase my workout performance.
people don't think about these things as being pharmaceuticals. And so the definition of a pharmaceutical really basic is a concentrated extract. The pharmaceutical industry is concentrating these things and then you take the prescription. And that's what a pharmaceutical is. And so if you step back before the pharmaceutical industry as we know it today, you had the pharmacy tradition. And so pharmacists are who compounded a lot of the medicine. They compounded perfumes. They would have extracted things as tinctures. Technically, a tincture is a pharmaceutical grade extract because it's a concentration. When you take certain Chinese medicine that we have and it's in a granular form, it'll usually be a five or a 10 to one concentration. That's a pharmaceutical concentration. It just means that things have been extracted and they're concentrated. And so when you look at an essential oil, because these are concentrations of the volatile compounds of a plant, they're essentially pharmaceutical grade extracts. And that causes some problems when you get into the legalities of how to use these things. It works its way into the flavor and fragrance industry. Just using essential oils and aromatherapy, there's all kinds of you know, meaningful ways that that kind of term can be used. And something to keep in mind here, because it's a pharmaceutical grade extract, you have to remember that it's concentrated. And so when you're looking at using these things topically on your skin, when you're looking at internally ingesting these things, really it's an issue of dose. And one of the hard things that people have trouble understanding is they see an essential oil, they'll see five milliliters or five grams out of essential oil. And yes, five milliliters is five milliliters is five milliliters. But each of the different plants have a different volatile yield. And so it might be a 0.1%, meaning that only 0.1% of the, the weight, the dry weight of the material yields an essential oil, whereas something else might have a two or a 3% yield. And so a 0.1% extract is actually much, much more concentrated than something that has a two or 3% yield. And so you have to look again at the yields and take that into account in terms of dosing, and it can get very complicated. And it's why I generally don't recommend lay people or people that don't really have the background, both in the essential oils, maybe a little bit of medical understanding. You don't necessarily have to be a licensed medical professional, but you need to understand the consequences and the implications of using these kinds of things because they are pharmaceutical grade extracts. They are highly concentrated volatile compounds. the pharmaceutical industry, the nutraceutical industry, flavors and fragrance and cosmetics, and everybody eats food, but nobody thinks about the spice trade, the whole culinary industry. All of these gajillion dollar industries are built on the back of herbs. Coca-Cola is now the most recognized brand on the planet, but nobody thinks about where it came from. The guy who invented Coca-Cola, what was his profession? And people usually look at me cross-eyed. His profession was as a pharmacist. And what did a pharmacist do back in the 19th century? He would have been in the 1880s creating this. Coca-Cola was originally formulated to create Coca-Cola, but it was a functional drink when it was created. And what was its purpose? So a lot of people don't realize that he was a Civil War vet, and a lot of Civil War vets had addictions to morphine. And so a lot of pharmacists throughout the United States were making cola-type drinks, or what we call colas now today, to treat morphine addictions for Civil War vets. And as the years progress, people are just drinking this as a beverage instead of as medicine. Again, using all of these different herb extracts, and a lot of them are common things too. You know, you had like pineapple flavoring and cinnamon and vanilla. You know, a lot of these things aren't, you know, really exotic things any longer, although they used to be in the past. And these were all compounded and sweetened and then mixed with seltzer water, and then you had this beverage. But the original purpose of it was medicine. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the fear of the natural world is these days. So people hear essential oils and they're afraid of them because they're natural and it's snake oil. And, you know, I work in Chinese medicine and it sounds so bogus because, you know, I've never heard of it, even though it's primary health care for half the world. But what's really funny is, you know, the table that you sit at is made of wood, a, a natural substance. The countertop is made of granite, which is a rock. You know, the shirt that I'm wearing, the pants that I'm wearing, they're made of cotton. They're natural materials. There's nothing really to be afraid of natural materials. I think what people start getting a little crazy about is when people make really wild claims about how to use things, uh, when people don't have the training in how to use them, 
And it really drives me nuts when people say, well, where's the research? And it's kind of like saying, cooking your food makes it taste better. Would anybody ever say, well, where's the research? I mean, my God, cook your food and then eat it. And holy crap, it tastes better. You know, like you don't need research to see that these things work, at least not research the way that they're talking about. And the other faulty thing there when people say, where's the research, is that when you search on the internet for something, first off, it's only searching in English. I work in Chinese medicine. Uh, I know lots of folks that speak a variety of different languages. When they hop on the internet and they search in their language, they get different information than I do. It's kind of like there are alternate universes. There's a lot of internets out there. There's a ton of information that you and I don't have access to because we're not searching for it in the language that it's written. And there's something like a hundred times more medical journals in China than there are in the United States. So when people say, where's the research? It's not that there's not research. It's just that you can't really find the research when you're searching for these things. And another funny thing is, is nobody says, where's the research on really basic stuff? Like, why is cooking my food this way better than this way? If I went to a culinary school, could you imagine telling the chef, tell me what the research is on caramelizing an onion in butter versus caramelizing it in sesame oil? Where's the research? You know, and the guy would just say, well, taste it. You know, which do you like better? It, I mean, sometimes it's that simple. Let me explain what a cell does during the day. How does the cell know what to do? We have a DNA, it's a spiral. We'll call it a helix. This DNA is part of your genetic code. This is how you look like you look, how I look like I look. That's determining your genes. So in order for the cells to look at your genes, what happens multiple times a day or multiple times even a second, that DNA has to open up. And now you have two strands of DNA that are coming apart. And these two strands are being copied. That copy is called an RNA. That copy will go into the cell. I mean, all, all that happens in the cell, in the nucleus of the cell. I say the most, you know, one of the most important parts of the cell. And the helix goes back together. So now we have a copy out there, and that copy will tell basically in what sequence you have to bring in certain amino acids to put together, to build together some blocks. It's like building Lego. And depending on what the RNA says, it's a different sequence. Depending on the sequence of the amino acid, you get different proteins or different hormones. This is how your body knows what to do. It's all built on this whole kind of process. The big question now becomes, how does the cell know this DNA is that long? How does it know to start reading here to here, not here to here? And we call these kind of pieces that will determine where you start reading this DNA transcription factors. They will go in there and determine you're going to start reading here and stop reading here. We know that certain foods, ingredients in the foods, act as transcription factors. Essential oils, we know, act as transcription factors. So the essential oil will tell your DNA where to start reading, where to stop reading. And that will determine what kind of proteins the cell will produce. And one thing that you don't see happening in modern Western science is once something has been shown, no one is going back and retesting the theories. And it's one of the reasons why when you see a pharmaceutical being released out into the public, 10 years later it's taken off the market. Because now what do you have? You have a real world experiment. You have multitudes of people taking this in a variety of different situations that they exist in. And then you see, does it work the way that they think it works? Is it effective? Is it harming people? What kinds of Side effect is really the wrong word. It's more like what kinds of unexpected actions does it have? Side effect sounds more negative than I think what the reality of it is. And as you look at these things again, over a span of time, that's what real science is. Clinical science, I think, is the really effective science because you can show anything to happen an isolated incident in a lab with a small group of people. But take it out into the world and you have thousands, millions of people using this and there's not a control. All of their lives are different, their diets are different, their habits are different. That's when you really see how something behaves within a population. How many people over at least 2,200 years of written history, and even the oldest texts reference that this stuff is older than the writing, and on top of that you have archaeological evidence that shows that this goes back several millennia. So there's no dispute that it's old. And I have trouble believing in a world where everything could potentially be life or death, that people would continue propagating something that doesn't work.
You know, why would people do something over and over again if it doesn't actually work? And why would large masses of people over a very large geographical space over several millennia of time keep doing something if it doesn't work? I mean, I don't know how more science that gets. But the truth is that oil has hundreds of compounds in it. And so if somebody asks you, what will that oil do? You can give them a quantum physics answer and say, what do you want it to do? Because it's just a packet of possibilities. And it's gonna manifest certain possibilities for you. It'll manifest different ones for me and different ones for somebody else. And so what decides what possibilities are manifest is your intention, the intention of the people or the person anointing you. And so out of that packet of possibilities, we make decisions on an unconscious or conscious level that pulls out of that oil certain things to happen. So we are wedded to the sciences and to the spiritual world through quantum physics.